Good morning and welcome to Complex Coronary Cases Live. Uh, this is our uh, eighth session and uh, keeping in tune with the recently concluded uh, the Japanese uh, CTO meeting, we have a CTO case today. So there is going to be a dazzling uh, a display of uh, different techniques, different wires, uh, anti-grade approach, retrograde approach, and uh, uh, we've got three experts uh, for you today. We have uh, Samin Sharma, Dr. Kinney, and uh, we have an expert from out of town, that is uh, uh, Bill Lombardi, who's uh, visiting us from St. Joseph in uh, Bellingham, uh, Washington. And uh, to introduce Bill, uh, he probably has done more uh, retrograde uh, C CTO procedures in the United States and uh, uh, from the last numbers I know he has done more than 700 CTOs so we have a, uh, uh, an, another expert in town and uh, I'm going to switch you right into the, loo into the room, uh, keep the session interactive, keep sending your questions. Once again the website for that is uh, info at cccliveCases.org. Uh, good morning Samin. Uh, you have uh, Bill Lombardi with you? Yes, good morning uh, Samir and uh, uh, the, and of course uh, good morning to all our uh, participant uh, who are logged in and Bill is here and of course with uh, uh, Dr. Keeney on my left side along with my fellows uh, that we start uh, last seven cases have been on the complexity in terms of the calcification, angulation and left main and we got a few emails about the total occlusion so that we have selected a patient for total occlusion this time and uh, just to start this is a 53 year old male uh, we uh, has a progressive exertional angina and he has a positive stress nuclear test in infralateral and a large area of anterior ischemia he has multiple risk factors as shown and had a prior cath and failed PCI five years ago in uh, New Jersey we actually don't have the exact information about it but he has about few months ago, two months ago, he had changed in symptoms and changed in stress test. That's why he came uh, on a good medical therapy. He had a cath at that time, which revealed normal EF, normal left main, and 100% LED proximally, which will show it to you with a collateral extensive from the RCA. And the RCA was non-obstructive. The OM was 70%. Looks like a fresh acute lesion with a ruptured plaque, little translucency, and had a stent there and went home and still continues to have exertional type uh, class 2 angina and we knowing that with a large area of ischemia on the thallium that we have probably brought him back to what he was uh, about two months ago. Now Anu has already taken uh, the angiogram and she can take us through what we have. So this is uh, LV gram. We hit today the EDP is still about uh, 14, 15 and uh, I think we've just gone over his medications uh, uh, what he's been taking. Still you see the apex little uh, discanetic. Uh, but otherwise, uh, anterolateral and almost up to the apex, you see the wall uh, coming in very nice. And RCA, non-obstructive, and uh, you have a grade uh, three good collaterals to the LED. If you see, actually, it's uh, through the septal, and also you have the surface collaterals. And uh, on the left system, if you see the left main non-obstructive, our circ stand looks very good, and the LED. Total occlusion is right after a couple of millimeters uh, of the origin of the LED. Uh, you see in the cranial view before the major septal, so it becomes proximal LED, and then there is this uh, diagonal, a small be uh, at the very uh, beginning, and then there is probably a 1.5 to 2 millimeter uh, uh, diagonal that's also uh, at the distal end of the total occlusion. So the question comes is uh, what would be the approach which uh, Dr. Sharma is going to go over right now? Yeah, I mean that's a, the, remember in the new, our new era or current era, the traditional old uh, classical um, adverse characteristics of CTOs kind of have disappeared. Uh, and uh, the, in the syntax scoring, the length of the segment still remains along with if there is a side branch originating at the lesion and of course the uh, taper versus blunt stump uh, and calcification so that this kind of a case because of the branch itself gives the adverse characteristics and we see only the segment after we have done the syntax score on this patient and syntax score is 22. Yeah we got a syntax score of 22 mainly 
the only one thing that is not here is the bridge collateral otherwise everything is uh, against uh, calculation there is a side branch though this is the side branch that is at the end it is not the reason they are asking for the side branch for the same is the adversity presence of the side branch that your wire might keep going to the side branch but where your syntax core gets you the highest point for total occlusion is the segment the distal segment that you see. So, if you, you see the immediate next, next segment your score is lower, but if you keep saying it is the second or the third segment that you are not seeing. So, that means if you are proximal RCA that is total occlusion and you are seeing a PDA AV continuation postolateral that is being filled, you would right away get a syntax score above 25 for a single, a single occluded uh, RCA and that is where I think it is against uh, uh, us for the interventionalists that really kicks off uh, right from the beginning with a very high syntax score and uh, presence of calcium uh, and because of the segment length that gives you the total length of the CTO uh, which are all adversities. Here we have not put it as presence of uh, calcium but ex uh, bridge collateral is not there but presence of side branch is there. Although there is a calcium, it is a nicely calcific both edges um, although I mean I initially thought about that patient had a stand there. Uh, right. But clearly, pain did not have any uh, stand procedure. We uh, figured that out. And to me, actually, you know what we saw now in two months, apical kind of achiness is if you go back, that this to me, if we actually uh, maybe the later part we will be able to show you what was there in December, that this apical severe hypo, and I'll show you some data of that to CTOs, that has gone, has become now, uh, it probably wasn't there. Now, coming back to the point, knowing that we have the expert, go to the last picture. Uh, with a bill, but the bill, if you had to do it from the retrograde point of view, what will be your approach? So, you know, in this case, if I was going to do retrograde, sort of the predictors of failure or, or the, the indications, I guess, to go retrograde would be a previous failed anagrade attempt, lesion length more than 30 millimeters, uh, osteal uh, occlusion or large side branch at the proximal cap. Um, and so, in this case, you know, it's sort of on the margins of doing it as a primary retrograde case. But uh, if I were, I would probably go out through the very distal PDA. There looks to be a septal coming out in the more mid to distal LAD. Um, and the idea is you want to get to the collateral sort of far away from the cap so that once you cross the collateral, you'll have enough running room to put the wire in. Um, and then I would come back with a, with a basically planned reverse cart strategy. Excellent. Uh, Bill, uh, so that would be almost a backup strategy, let's say, for any reason, if one is not able to cross today, that is something one can still consider. Uh, uh, Samin, uh, I noticed that you already are uh, bilaterally cannulated. Is that something you're doing uh, routinely? Yeah, I think that uh, will be the point which uh, we'll discuss. Therefore, I'll take about now same uh, 10 minutes to go over the whole concept of CTO. And if we can go back to our slides, and then we'll come back to this case knowing that it may take a little extra time, so that I'll keep, try to finish this uh, uh, preview. Uh, the, keep the same, our format, that first give the patient history, show the angiogram, and the important topic, uh, salient, uh, some slides on that topic, uh, particularly technique and the outcome point of view, and then come back with the performance of the case, and if time permits, just our last slide of the take-home message. Now, CTO, we know, is a big problem, problem in the sense that even in the syntax trial, Barry trial, 60% of the time, exclusion for cabbage, uh, exclusion for PCI was uh, CTO. The day-to-day -day life, we know that CTO, even if we uh, uh, encounter one CTO, that our inclination more to send the patient for surgery, so that big issue. Overall uh, intervention of the CTO, actually we have the data from the NCDR, that about 11%, 12% of the CTOs are tried by PCI. Majority of them either left alone or medical therapy. That actually has not changed in the last four or five years. So that 12 to 13 percent of CTO lesions are tried by PCI. And uh, now, just to say that, yes, we have got better in terms of uh, CTO recanalization, but syntax trial, uh, the really contemporary with the multi centers, that only 53 percent of the lesions were successful in the syntax trial with the CTO. Now, the adverse factors, why people don't want to do CTOs? Because of the lower success rate, you're disappointed, yourself, the patient, family, everybody. Longer cases disrupt the schedule. More radiation exposure in very long cases can develop dermatitis just like 
some of the long EP cases. More resource utilization. There is no extra reimbursement. For physician, we put a 99 modifier we get for the CTO. But other for the hospital point of view, there is no separate modifier for the increased reimbursement. And yes, the complications are low, but could happen and could be catastrophic. Very commonly thrombus because of multiple catheters in the wire, dissection with a guide catheter or the balloon, pro proximally perforation and cardiac tamponade could happen. Then collateral shutoff, side branch occlusion, MI, and of course the contrast induced uh, nephropathy is uh, one of the big issues. This actually, I will use this randomized trial of the TOAST GC, which is the 29 centers, about 400 uh, CTOs, really gives, will give us the landscape and uh, the, what we expect. Now you see that death, QAMI, urgent cabbage, uh, tamponade does occur. So that it's not without risk. So that we always have to justify which case we are doing for the CTO. The, then question comes, then why to bother for the PCI? With the PCI, we either send for surgery. Uh, many patients, of course, will not go for surgery, but we want to do PCI because there are two important points. One is the presence of CTO in the CAD imparts adverse prognosis. And I'll show you the data on that. And the second point is that if you are successful, the data to support that you, it gives rise to angina and ischemia relief, freedom for subsequent cabbage, improves LV function, and then improvement in event-free survival for successful CTO recanalization. So I'll take one by one. What is the adverse prognosis? This is actually our first pa paper by New York State database which looked into that when you have multi-vessel disease, the two uh, the disease vessel, but not CTO, had an odd ratio of, say, 1.88. But if you have two disease vessel, but one of them is CTO, it clearly the risk goes up uh, with the, the mortality uh, at uh, three years in this group of patients. So CTO imparted bad prognosis. Now, what about in the era of the DS? You can see here the latest paper in uh, our Jack intervention, similar message that if you have a two-vessel disease but no CTO, mortality at 18 months in the DES era, about 88% were the DES, was 5.9. But your two incompletely revascularized vessel with a CTO is 7.1. And largely it is driven uh, by, of course, the myocardial infarction so that clearly that presence of CTO gives the bad prognosis. Why? Largely because that when your second vessel will go down, which gives the collateral, patient will present with the double vessel MI compared to single. Second issue, this is a very interesting data from Netherlands, that patients who have CTO at the time of MI, and these are the data on the large number of patients, uh, 3,300 STEMI patients, and of many of them multi-vessel disease and 22% multi-vessel and 13% uh, had a CTO with a multi-vessel. And you can see there that at the time of STEMI, the, whether you have a CTO or multi-vessel disease without CTO, not only had a 30-day mortality, but even at five years, that presence of CTO even beyond 30 day imparted the bad prognosis in a patient with the STEMI. And largely it is dependent, it was in my opinion mediated by LV function, that people with a CTO will continue to deteriorate their LV function. And this is where the big issue comes, that uh, even if you leave the CTO, and this is a very strong uh, the data to support that yes, CTO is a bad prognostic factor. So now we come back to the angina. Numerous studies have shown that there is, once you open the vessel, patients either become asymptomatic in over 80% of cases, or their ischemia decreases in the successful CTO cases. There, there were no question on that. The same thing from that, uh, the TOEST GC trial, that uh, patients who have CTO success compared to CTO failure, higher degree of have a less, uh, no angina, of course they have a better exercise capacity. Now then, issue comes is that need for cabbage. As I mentioned, that CTO is the important determinant of uh, lay, uh, short or long-term cabbage. Numerous studies have answered that question, that you are successful CTO, you delayed or you uh, decreased the incidence of late cabbage. And same thing for the, that randomized trial, that if you are successful, 12-month uh, need for uh, cabbage was 2.4% versus 16% if the CTO failed. Then issue comes LV function. This is, the again, the study from Netherlands very mechanistic, they did a MRI uh, patients at the baseline at uh, five months and then at, uh, at follow-up of uh, uh, three years in 21 patients, and they measured the ejection fraction and the wall thickness. As you can see, 
there was a trend towards improvement in ejection fraction in successful recanalization. But more important is the wall thickness. And wall thickness actually, this is a little busy slide, but uh, segmental wall thickness, the, if you have a less than transmural MI, less than 25%, that successful recanalization improve the wall thickness. Therefore, it's basically that if you are not transmural, you open the vessel, you improve the LV function or trend towards improve LV function, and of course, improve the wall thickness. Now, even in patients who had the 25 to 75% transmural MI, there was no benefit at five months, but at three years, you can see significant improvement in the segmental wall motion thickness so that it may take some time uh, in these patients. But if you have more than 75%, was not significant. Then what about improved survival? Again, numerous studies have shown successful CTO recanalization, improved survival compared to non-successful classical, uh, the, uh, the data from Thorax Center by Hoey uh, in 2005 in European Heart Journal, the about 5% improved survival in a CTO recanalization. Overall, the data have been anywhere between 2 to 9%. And uh, the same, both uh, uh, the uh, survival and MI significantly reduced in this group of patient uh, uh, with the successful versus non-successful in about 900 patient trial. The recent data from Mayo Clinic uh, that is there an effect of the individual vessel? And I think the answer is yes, LAD CTO. That LAD successful, CTO versus unsuccessful, 15% uh, survival at three years, uh, I mean mortality versus 4.7 in the successful, while in the non-LAD CTO, CERC or RCA was not different. The same, uh, the then question comes, that many of these events are occurring by because of the re-stenosis, that what about the DES? There are numerous data now accumulated for the CTO, uh, DES, but uh, the present two randomized trial of the BMS versus uh, DES with the serolumus, uh, 100 patient each, showed clearly that lower TVR, TLR, with a slightly 2% versus 5% increase in stent thrombosis, slightly higher, but overall, the the message is that once you open the vessel, should go with the DES. Now, what about the new devices? Many of the devices, which is the primal laser, front runner, safe history, cross uh, radio frequency or cross or vibrational catheter, these are all approved by FDA. But how many times we use it? Very, very little. Probably less than 2% of the CTOs are done. The lot of devices are under investigation, including the uh, injection of the collagen age and uh, mechanical and pharmacological. But these devices, one, I really like the one which goes through the wall, the Pioneer catheter. The trials are ongoing at Prime, just like they do it in the periphery. Outback catheter concept, go through the wall and puncture the distal vessel uh, and uh, then do the PCI. The basically the success of CTO, which has improved over the last few years, has been because of the stiff guide wires. And then, of course, with the Miracle family and Asai and uh, Abbott, they, the, with the increasing stiffness, we have the wires available, with the, starting with the cross it to uh, going to Miracle and Confianza. It basically gives you the stiffness. And of course, Anu will have a time uh, during her uh, uh, the case performance to go over some of the tips uh, that uh, the whether use a, which case use a Miracle Bro versus use a Confianza taper tip because just like a needle. And uh, the Abbott actually coming with a new wire, the high torque progress family, which is from 40 to 200 uh, T, increasing stiffness. Uh, we haven't started using it yet, but seems to be a new family uh, of uh, CTO wires. And we know the Shinobi by uh, J and J and Persuader by Medtronic also in that family. Now then comes the technique. The anti-grade technique, uh, basically the three types, control drilling, basically you rotate and advance. The second is the penetration technique that you tap and keep advancing with the more stiffer uh, wire. And the last being the sliding technique using the micro channel so that you go through those micro channels and in order to get a success. Of course, uh, the most commonly used is the control drilling that you are rotating and advancing your catheter and if it does not get a resistance, then you go with a more stiffer catheter. Various advanced techniques, which I call it a Japanese specialized techniques, which is the anchor balloon, really gives you the good guide support. Now we actually have the mother-child catheter technique, that catheter can go up to the, uh, the total occlusion, gives you extra support. Parallel wire, IVAS guidance, and of course the retrograde approach has been mentioned, the, usually for LED or RCA, and could be direct retrograde crossing of the wire, uh, and then, or kissing wire, though you go over retrograde as well as integrate, and lastly being the control 
anti-grate and retrograde technique, which is basically that you're causing the dissection, get into the lumen and subsequent dilatation and stenting. Then needs a support catheter. In order for you to change uh, the catheter wire frequently, you should go with the over the wire system. Uh, choice is yours, whether fine cross or, or a 1.5 balloon or quick cross and mini cross and so. We actually use uh, uh, the fine cross uh, most commonly. Uh, and then now actually Abbott has another catheter, Corsair, uh, particularly through the channel dilator and retrograde. Uh, maybe we have started using it in some cases. Fine cross, uh, we liked it because it goes very uh, easily. And uh, most of the time, we were once wire went in, we were able to advance the fine cross. Rare case that the fine cross would not go. I should go the CL. The, the, uh, that uh, fine cross did not cross when the wire went. But otherwise, of the Taruma, this is our preferred workhorse support catheter at this time. Now, uh, as you, I said, that uh, Crossair, uh, Corsair uh, of uh, Abbott uh, is another one available. Then the question uh, comes with anticoagulation, and I know there is a lot of, lot of controversy that classical teaching has been that use heparin uh, in because you cannot reverse the effect of heparin uh, in the CTOs, but uh, this is our paper just came out, and of course there has been a lot of issues. Uh, uh, I have a letter to the editor on so. Uh, the issue has been that our personal experience that just for the wire perforation, we are not talking about the device perforation the, caused by the rotablation or by the stent edge or stent, but wire perforation, what we have learned is whether we compare the heparin, which is the blue versus red being angiomax, uh, bivalurin, that we found that wire perforation occurring on angiomax was associated with very low complication compared to heparin. Now you say, well, how is it possible? We don't have any antidote, but so what? But basically, since it's a self-limiting and collagen-mediated platelet aggregation is still is favored, that in my opinion, that is the region that why uh, bivalutin, as you know, that Japanese are very strict about it. But in the, our lab, they have come a few times, and we told them that we use Angiomax. Reluctantly, they have used it. But uh, I hope uh, that more and more data will continue to accrue on this field that uh, using the bivalutin and CTO, and we have no issues with that. So just to put uh, last la is that uh, the technical consideration, that plant procedure, actually Anu has the, uh, the uh, calendar that don't book more than one or two CTOs in a day because careful assessment of the symptoms and target site viability, very, very important. Ischemia based on the appropriateness criteria, and what does that mean? And this slide actually shows uh, that lot of eyes, inappropriate. You see the CTO, even uh, with the intermediate risk positivity and your double medical therapy with a single vessel, inappropriate. Only if the two medical therapy and patient has a large area of ischemia is appropriate so that we are under scrutiny, particularly the CTO, so that avoid the oculostenotic reflex, particularly of the CTO of the RCA. Then proper view, and of course you see the distal vessel we have talked about, guide catheter support, the whether six or eight French, I know Japanese prefer the long, the uh, the eight the eight French guide, but we do uh, majority of uh, by with the six French. If you're using an anchor balloon or some uh, two balloons, maybe use with a seven French and transfemoral. There are some data. The one study showed that transfemoral, transradial for integrated at least was no difference. One study showed that transfemoral has a higher success rate for the uh, CTO integrate recanalization. So this is up in the air. But radial can be done. People had done bilateral radials, and of course long teeth. Uh, this is what uh, we have done in this particular case, which is what, 45 centimeter? Yeah. It's called the next to the lesion sheath. Yeah. This is that comes to the, to the as you can see in the middle, uh, that the sheath has gone up to the mid of the uh, middle part of aorta. So that uh, see the dot in the center, that uh, long sheath uh, really help stabilize the guide and short guide if you are using retrograde. And the bilateral angiography is a must, in my opinion. Then time limit for radiation exposure and the contrast volume. So you have to have it that maybe 400 cc's, 500 cc's. Just decide in your lab that you are going to try the case for three hours. Radiation fluoro time of 60 minutes or 90 minutes. Clearly that do not go beyond triple digit of the fluoro time. And of course every machine is equipped to give you the fluoro time. Initial floppy wire passage for the distal or angulated CTOs. Very important that if you have angulated, your stiff wire will not go. So bring your over the wire system 
and with a floppy wire, take the floppy wire out and then change it to your stiff because many times the dissection occurs by using the stiff catheter while reaching there. And of course, increase stiffness of the wire and support transit catheter or a small over the wire balloon. And of course, with that note, uh, we are ready to start uh, and Anu just can tell us what uh, her strategy is. Yeah, we just have uh, for the support Loud. catheter, we have used the fine craw uh, the ready here. Uh, I think based on the atomical description of this lesion, if you see, it's a blunt tip. So on the various technique that uh, Dr. Sharma just mentioned, uh, how do we start? I think the first thing that you would look when you have a total occlusion, which is more than three months, is do we see any um, you know, fine channels there? So if you go with the classical uh, teaching, they always say go with your uh, floppy wire, uh, which is usually either the fielder or fielder XT. If you see how the fielder XT is, the tip is very tapered. And you can see if there is any fine channels and that wire may go through the channels and you may be successful just with that wire. But knowing that this patient has had it for many years, already had an unsuccessful PCI in the past, that's unlikely we may be successful by using those wire, and this is already in the proximal portion of the vessel. So we have chosen to use uh, the Miracle uh, 3, which is almost like uh, if uh, people are used to the older type of uh, cross-it wires, uh, it is uh, almost like a cross-it 100. So you have 3, 4.5, 6, 9. We don't carry all, all of those here. We just have the 3, 6, and then we are going to have the now, the classical teaching of how to make a curve for this kind of wires, if you see here, because it's a CTO, you do not want a dissection that to happen, is you get your wire, you go through your uh, wire introducer, and when you are at the tip of the wire introducer, two millimeters. Yeah, one to, between 1 to 1.2, where you can make a curve like this. But uh, truly speaking, I never use that. I just do the curve with my fingertip and just use that way. But that's a classical teaching that that's the way you need to be used. So having gone through that, and the most important thing also that which we don't do compared to the classical teaching is uh, our uh, contralateral injection is always uh, four or five. Usually is a five uh, sheath, and that's connected here. And the other one is a six French. Again, long sheath. Long sheath is very important to give you a good guide support. And usually, uh, if it is a LED, though depending on the size of the left main, if the left main is anywhere more than 10 millimeter, which is a case here, we like a VL, which gives you a better support compared to the FCL and RCA. We would like to start with the Lima, which is a moderate kind of a support. If it does not give you enough support, that's the only time we would change to an uh, AL guide and not start with the AL guide right from the beginning. No, very practical uh, tips, uh, uh, all I'm sure are going to be uh, very handy for a uh, lot of people doing total occlusions. Uh, Samin, excellent review. Uh, uh, one wonders uh, what uh, else uh, may be uh, left to speculation there beyond a very detailed and a very comprehensive uh, analysis here. I want to bring in uh, Bill here. Bill, anything uh, further you would add and uh, more pertinently, would this be your preferred uh, why to approach this kind of a case? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Dr. Sharma and Kitty have done an outstanding job of sort of laying out uh, how we do CTO and why we do CTO. Um, you know, I kind of make, you know, the, the appropriateness guidelines, it's interesting in that they separated out CTOs from uh, uh, non-CTOs, despite the data that Dr. Sharma just went through that clearly shows that there may be more benefit in revascularization of CTOs than in non-CTOs. So it's an interesting... Uh, review of that literature. Um, I think from a, a strategy standpoint, I agree the dual injections as they're doing here, we do that in about 95% of cases um, because of uh, the whole point is being able to visualize the distal portion of the vessel mm. so that you can steer and drive the wire the side, uh, right? appropriately. Okay. Um, so that, that's usually our generalized approach. I often actually, no matter what the case, will take a workhorse wire Initially, just because the bends that are required to get to the, the proximal cap are usually somewhat different than that we'll need a CTO. So it can help facilitate getting an over-the-wire catheter into the proximal cap. Yes, sir, confianza. Between the over-the-wire small catheter or a support catheter, Bill, what would be your preferred uh, strategy? Right. So 
the, the way you have to look at your support catheter is kind of how, what the real point of the support catheters is one, they actually can make the wire tips stiffer. So looking at each of the catheter types, having a uh, over-the-wire catheter near the tip of a wire actually will increase its stiffness. Now the fine cross does that the least. An over-the-wire balloon would be next, and then the tornus catheter would give it the most stiffness. Um, you know, the fine cross is sort of the preferred catheter to get to the proximal cap and do wire exchange through. It's sort of the softest, most lubricious catheter. It's got a very low uh, crossing profile, which is nice. The radio opaque marker at the end gives you a lot of confidence that you're in the right location uh, and know where your wire exchanges and base of operations will be. So usually it's either the fine cross or an over-the-wire balloon or the traditional catheters, depending on how much support and stiffness you may need. Excellent. Samin, did you reshape the wire or um, no, uh, reposition the guiding the, catheter? No, also, the disadvantage here is because it's uh, very proximal. Yeah. Uh, we are difficult to negotiate the well, stiffer wire. So we exact. change it to the fielder. And the other thing also important which the fine cross gives us is that uh, able to, as you're going forward with whatever technique that you're going to do, most often is your drilling technique because you have this long uh, segment. Fine cross uh, negotiates to that uh, through the tighter lumen better than, uh, uh, you know, the over the wire balloon. So, I mean, we have very observant people. One of them already notes you have a cap on today. <laughs> oh. Maybe, maybe the same person who asked us the question yes. last time. No I cap, and I'm going to put the mask very soon too. All right, so yeah. we are making progress. The IDE oh, people. Believe will me, be that very with happy. all this, uh, we already have uh, with the, our channel four and seven. One of the complaint was when the, with the Bill Clinton last Thursday, uh, we had a case done that we did not have a cap and mask. Actually, we had a cap. Uh, cap fell off, a mask just slid. <laughs> if you can believe that. So the idea of the chronicity of the lesion could be sensed okay. from the way your That's wire is buckling there right away. Give sedation, Vicky. Uh, Bill, what is your anticoagulant strategy for these cases? So I've sort of followed the, the traditional history and used heparin uh, anticoagulation, usually with an antegrade approach trying to run the ACT of 300, and in retrograde being very meticulous to keep the ACTs greater than 350, with very frequent checks because of the risk of thrombus formation. Um, I think the data with Angiomax is very intriguing. We're actually uh, a couple of different or re database research going on right now to sort of evaluate whether Angiomax may actually be a preferred strategy, sort of challenging the paradigm as we move forward. And there's some discussions about potentially developing a trial to further evaluate this. So I, I agree that uh, Angiomax may continue to play a role. If you look at uh, some of the more current uh, literature of CTO-PCI, the perforation rate is about 0.7 percent, which is fairly low and actually, um, it's actually worse for low volume operators when compared to high volume operators. So experience seems to limit or reduce the risk of coronary perforation. Bill, I'm sure uh, many cases are referred to you specifically for the retrograde uh, technique considering your expertise, but uh, otherwise uh, if you don't, uh, if you separate those out, what would be your proportion of anti-grade versus retrograde? Well, actually, interesting you, enough, I, get, I actually until this year have, have actually gotten very few referrals from outside my institution. And so actually most of my procedures were from within my own practice. In my Right now, about 45% of my procedures are retrograde PCI. Um, the advantage of retrograde is it actually can make procedures somewhat faster. It uh, deals with the issue of getting subintimal uh, a lot better, and it also allows you to deal with a lot more anatomic challenges. And if you are going anti-grade, uh, you also universally use a long sheath and uh, bilateral cannulation? Yes, but the very rare case will we not do bilateral injections. So we almost in, always use long sheaths, uh, very supportive guides as Dr. Kinney is doing here, and, uh, and then use a wire escalation strategy in general, just as uh, has been proposed here where we start with a workhorse wire and then a Miracle Bro 3, 6, 12, Convienza Pro 12. And then and my, my other favorite CTO wire is actually the Pilot 200, which uh, because of its polymer coating, it's only about a 4.7 gram wire, but because of its polymer coating actually has the ability to, uh, to cross lesions where a Convienza Pro 12 or be able to re-enter better than the Convienza Pro 12. 
and I am assuming that uh, we most are changing of your the guide here to FCL because Excellent. the VL is mainly facing to the circ and uh, not getting us into the LAD. Right. Uh, just going to the point of uh, the dual injection, why you actually need a dual injection is when you have come out of the CTO and you are at the lumen of the vessel and the exit point to truly know, I mean of course your feel is important and the wire movement is very important, but to be sure that you are in the lumen, sometimes you could be subintimal and you know just uh, at that cap and to know that is the time you really need the dual injection really helps you, do you have to proceed or do you have to pull the wire back and uh, renegotiate it, change the tip, that is uh, that's very helpful at that particular moment to know exactly that you are in the lumen of the distal portion of the vessel. Anu, as far as I am concerned, I think it should become an absolute uh, mandate for uh, doing a, a CTO is to have a bilateral uh, cannulation. So, uh, no, no uh, discussion with me on that point. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely convinced. Uh, Bill, uh, most of your procedures are done through the femoral route or uh, you double your radiation exposure uh, going radially? <laughs> <laughs> so, actually for my, my non-CTOs, about 50 percent of my practice is, is actually radial. But for CTOs, except for rare cases, I basically am 100% femoral. I, I tend to use seven and eight French guides for my both retrograde and anagrade, um, just because there are a lot of situations where you need two catheters, visualization may become more difficult, and also the amount of, of push support that's required to get through these lesions can be very great. And so my, I tend to use uh, little higher French guides. See, support catheters are also not necessarily without uh, uh, some issues because uh, as an example, uh, they could uh, prevent you from um, entering uh, as could be happening, you know, uh, often the freedom of the wire movement is somewhat restricted in uh, getting exactly to the lesion. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, that's one of the reasons most people won't work through a tornus catheter is because the coils of the tornus interface with the coils of the wire and make it... Uh, the wire feel very gritty and sticky, so that's why most people like to work through the fine cross or an over-the-wire balloon. Now, Samin provided us a, a, a large uh, uh, spectrum of uh, some of the new devices. Uh, amongst uh, those, any your favorites, Bill? Well, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm sort of it's sort of John Henry versus the machine. You know, the Japanese have a 90% success rate using balloons and microcatheters and wires. Um, Dr. Thompson and I showed in our data in JAXI earlier this year that we can achieve a 91% success rate in the U.S. with wires and balloons. So there haven't been a lot of really interesting technologies to me. The, the ones that are out there that seem to have the most potential interest is one is from a company called Bridgepoint Medical Systems called the Cross Boss and Stingray Reentry Catheter, which is uh, the, the catheter is basically a flat balloon that works similar to a a uh, pioneer and that it will orient in the subintimal space and help tell you which way to go with collateral injections can allow you to do re-entry, which is, I think, a, a very novel, interesting technology. The other, obviously, is I think forward-looking IVIS has the potential to be very intriguing if we can get that technology to work. Uh, again, for, I think if we're waiting for a technology to make these easier, I think it's still going to be a, uh, quite a period of time. And I think really it behooves on the interventionalists is to gain the experience to, on all the techniques to achieve a high success rate. So and I think I agree with that because remember all these three wire, three devices, like uh, where they have gone now, nobody using them. Right. They're using peripheral. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the, yeah. it's the, the wasteland for all interventional yeah. yep. coronary stuff goes to periphery. Yep. So, Samin, now you have a situation that uh, with the very proximally occluded LED, each time I saw you bring the support catheter, uh, it buckles around and uh, the wire uh, uh, drops into the circumflex. Uh, what, you're going to reshape the wire? You're going to try without uh, the support catheter or uh, what are you planning here? Okay. Uh, we were right now, you know, we have jumped the gun now. We already with the... Confianza just to see if the stiff wire will give any support. So going if it down still doesn't the, let us, we may have to use the venture or the wire venture. Excellent. So escalation of the wire strategy yeah. exactly as we had uh, illustrated there. Uh, Bill, the way our uh, CCC live uh, cases work is uh, that uh, as uh, you people are uh, doing the cases, I get a lot of uh, questions from the viewers. I try to filter some of them and ask uh, the pertinent ones, and here is the first one for you. 
In a busy practice, uh, do you think uh, there should be a dedicated person to do total occlusions? Uh, you know, I, I would tell you in general, I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, that's certainly how we did it in our practice. One is to, to gain the, the experience we've demonstrated. It takes about two or 300 CTO procedures to really learn all the different novel techniques to get good. Um, and also, as with anything, if you do lots of it, you get more efficient and faster at it. So our practice strategy has been to support basically one operator. I get all the, all the failed CTOs and most of the primaries now. Um, and I do think for a, from a practice standpoint, narrowing the volume and having one or two operators get a significant volume can be beneficial. We also set up our, our days structurally um, that I get a day where I just do CTOs. So I'll do four CTOs in one day so that you alleviate some of the issues of having other, other things that you have to go deal with, the QMI, the long cath lab schedule day, and, and that seems to be very successful. And with all these CTOs, I'm sure you glow in the dark. You know, interestingly, I'm fifth on the radiation for my hospital. Our EP and peripheral guys get a lot more than I do. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. In my data, our average procedure time is 91 minutes with a floral time of 37. So it's actually a lot lower than a lot of the people that do periphery and do limb salvage and femoral CTOs that you can actually do these procedures in a reasonable amount of time with sort of a lot of practice. Another uh, fascinating question coming in, Bill. Uh, uh, you could take a shot of it, or uh, Samin. Uh, would there be a situation when you will absolutely not do a CTO? Well, that's a very good point, uh, that uh, if the indications are there, I mean, clearly, the first thing is, is it indicated? If it is indicated, which case would you not do it? I mean, same thing, that if there is a chance that you cannot go retrograde, very diffuse disease, very angulated, where the chances of... Uh, complications are higher. I mean, that will be the group that you do not want to use uh, in, in that particular case. The, what will be the example? An example will be it's a side branch. If it's the LED, you will try once, you maybe try second time because the, clearly the patience and second attempt has really helped to improve our success. That you failed uh, in 25%, you bring them back into a uh, six to 12 weeks period and another half of them you have succeeded. So that after the second attempt, your success failure rate is just in single digits of uh, eight, nine percent and so. So that second attempt, yes, but clearly that patients who have, has uh, the very long total occlusion with the unfavorable anatomy in, the, in terms of calcification, uh, not a case for the retrograde injection, in my opinion will be that, you know, let's back off. Even if it's indicated, this guy probably will be will do better off with the aggressive medical therapy than anything else. Makes Can perfect sense uh, spending hours on a total occlusion when you open it to put in a drug eluting stent. Amongst the drug eluting stents, I mean, what would you prefer? Well, I mean, the, we know that uh, the, at present, uh, at our center, the Everlumus eluting stent is the uh, most commonly used, uh, although the data we don't have yet from the randomized trial point of view. Uh, for uh, uh, for the, um, uh, the, the science cranial. and so hmm? cranial. cranial yeah now actually you see but you keep you want to say something about uh, what why is it going on now no, I'm not okay anything. all right uh, the the basically that uh, there are data on the both uh, cipher first generation cipher and taxes um, and uh, but we uh, we are comfortable and uh, that's what we use once succeed in this patient, uh, what is our workhorse uh, stent is, and that is the science in our cath lab. Now, uh, Anno able to get uh, this wire with a very delicate situation at this time, with a very little support. It's a, a Confianza, it's a Confianza nine, Pro, yeah. Pro, which is nine, nine gram. And of course, it comes with a 12 gram also. Uh, but uh, you need a little further before you can bring well, everything uh, which, uh, which can challenge uh, total occlusion, we have been seeing uh, different views. I have been seeing her notice uh, escalation of wires, uh, trying to modify the uh, reposition, the guiding catheter, bring uh, back and forth the support catheter. And uh, uh, one of the good things about a chronic total occlusion on a live case is it uh, gives you a chance to discuss many other issues. Uh, Bill, what would be your uh, preferred uh, stent? Well, you know, the, the, the only 
FDA, you know, the only stent that's actually got really good data in this era is Cypher from cross Cypher data. Dave Kenzari was a PI. And that showed, a, you know, the T TLR, TLR rate of about 10% with one of the biggest problems being stent fracture. Um, and so one of, one of my practices, been is I, I agree. I think the ever lemus eluding stents uh, and a lot with the cobalt chromium stents uh, that the risk of stem fracture may be significant lower. So I, I agree. I think that the, the uh, you know, Zions has an excellent uh, platform with a very low late loss, which I think in CTO is, is an important aspect, and also having uh, the less likely of stent fracture given the metal of cobalt chromium is important. Yeah, as you see here. Uh, this is on. exactly what I was telling you is that we are trying to come out, and I know that uh, we are in the, probably just outside the vessel with this angiogram. It was moving freely. That doesn't mean that we are in the lumen. So this is when a contralateral injection really helps you. So pull back and uh, renegotiate the wire. And I, and I think one of the important points that Dr. Kinney is doing here, which is critical, is, is you notice she's really not doing any more integrated injections. And the reason for that is she's got a catheter and a wire now probably in the subintimal space. And if you do integrated injections, one, they add little value because it doesn't tell you where the vessel is. And two, there's a potential to cause a hydraulic dissection that's uncontrollable. So if you notice, she's only right. taking the retrograde pictures now to help her redirect and steer the uh, confianza back into the true lumen of the vessel. Extremely valuable teaching point. Uh... Also reduce your contrast use. Sure. Bill, uh, over uh, this, this is a very uh, serious issue and uh, uh, I think contemplates uh, some, some uh, uh, careful thought. Uh, how with the people like you in town uh, doing uh, hundreds of these uh, uh, total occlusions, retrograde, anti-grade uh, being referred from all over, how is that impacting cardiac surgery in, uh, in your area? Well, you know, it's interesting. It actually hasn't impacted much at all because to me the, the indications for surgery are still the indications for surgery. Most of our, of our practice actually ends up being post-cabbage right coronaries. We have about 38% of the patients that I do CTO intervention on are post-bypass surgery. Um, so it really is at least not really had much effect. And it's really nice in those patients who get refused for bypass surgery that we can still offer them complete revascularization. I think in the current era, that's really what our goal has to be, is about completeness of revascularization. As Dr. Sharma was showing with the, the Hannon data, that that really is where the benefit to percutaneous intervention or surgery is, is to get complete revascularization. Well. What uh, part of your uh, practice bill today is uh, CTOs? Uh, so, Last year, about 50% of the interventions I did were CTO, PCI. Um, it's become a very, very big practice. I don't do peripheral or other. I basically am just a high-end coronary. And so most of my practice is, is CTO. And again, I'm very, very supported by my partners and our group in North Cascade Cardiology uh, to refer the cases to me and allow me to do them. So it sort of predisposes me to the volume. Excellent. I mean, uh, exactly. thoughts on the case here? Uh, yeah, we actually, the, the little die. Mm. That uh, the catheter, you know, that's always the problem with the soft, uh, the catheter, they become very soft, comes out. Uh, a little higher. Yeah. Okay. A little die. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. So we just want to, because uh, Anu has gone a little distal, and want to make sure the same thing, that where are we? In terms of this, you want to take a picture? No, no. Yeah, that little so puff kind of gave us a very hazy idea. There, uh, it does look uh, you are subintimal, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah we are. So you can see, Dr. Kinney is a very experienced CTO operator. Is really coming back, you know, very proximally and trying to find a new area of resistance to try to cross into a new channel and facilitate getting into the uh, through the distal cap. Um, And again, you just have to be very slow and patient at this point to find those areas of resistance and release as you move forward. And that's, again, one of the challenges is it requires a lot of experience because a lot of this, as you can see, is just feel, that she's almost feeling her way through the artery and where she's going. 
Bill, how long has been your uh, longest procedure time for a total occlusion? Four hours and four minutes, and that was because we lost a stent in the osteal right corner, and we spent a bunch of time retrieving it. Actually, you know, I, uh, two years ago when I was in the, uh, Japan, they have, you know, the, the total occlusion, they will uh, make it um, as a, uh, like a Suzuki's um, uh, live and uh, uh, the Kimura live and so. And I can uh, tell you that we exchange three moderators with four hours each. <laughs> that patient was a bypass graft closed and they went through and next day, there were eight hours of live and the next day they came and that time was successful. Oh, that is quite a stamina and quite a marathon. Yeah. Some, some would argue, you know, I was uh, once asked uh, uh, at a session in Asia as yeah, to that it takes uh, the Japanese two hours, 20 minutes to make a uh, manufacture a Honda car. Uh, it should not be taking a chronic total occlusion longer than that. So. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That, I think that's a good analogy. <laughs> well, and I, and I think that's, that's something that, uh, you know, there's several of us trying to promote intervent this in the U.S., myself, uh, Aaron Grantham at Mid-America Heart, and Craig Thompson at Yale. You know, that this is a procedure that can be done in the U.S. It can be done reasonably quickly. There's just some modifications of the approach that need to occur to allow it to be done quickly in the U.S. And I, that's really what we've been challenged and working on. Like I said, the average procedure time in, for a CTO in my lab is 91 minutes. And, you know, I think that's a reasonable, a reasonable time for us to work. But it took me two years to get to a point where I could do that on a regular basis. Right. Okay, okay. What are you doing now? I'm going to 12. Now, I'm changing to a confianza. I think last, uh, uh, the segment, the, we keep going into this uh, subintimal channel, yeah, which has I been created. Now, question is that, you know, the parallel wire, a lot of people will leave that wire and try to do a second. I have been not much... Uh, successful with that um, and uh, we basically just to redirect. Anu, would, uh, do you think uh, uh, it may be useful to come back just yeah, yeah, a little bit with the do. support? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, even further back. Right, as as right. because uh, very hard to make out where exactly the wire entered into the sub and uh, uh, you know it's a excellent demonstration of uh, what total CTOs can be even in expert hands. Uh, Bill, what else is promising out there in the horizon? Uh, where do you see this whole uh, field going to? Well, I think really what's, what's promising is a lot of people like Dr. I'm Sharma sorry. and Dr. Kinney who are promoting the field and promoting the techniques and, and the procedural skill set to, uh, to open these up. I think you know, technology at this point is probably not going to solve the issue. It's really going to be an operator skill set. And in some ways, it's almost going back to the old days of, of uh, coronary intervention where we started with angioplasty, with proctoring, and live case demonstrations. Again, just slightly inferior there. Yeah, and I, I, I you know, that if we offer uh, 400 uh, coronary interventions, actually for about 425, uh, the PCI is every month, uh, about 150 are referred. Of the 150, about uh, 75 are from the rotational hysterectomy. Uh, good. Oh, now, that see this is a a wonderful progress. Yeah. 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 Anu, Give what did you do different now besides I thought you did pull back on the support catheter a little bit. Yeah. I think support catheter and found a new channel. And did you tactile, did you get a different feeling this yes, time as yes. you were grinding your way? Yeah, yeah. It's the same, the drilling. You know, like a lot of people uh, uh, about the drill and gradually advancement. And just was saying that half of them are referred to us for uh, basically CT uh, for uh, calcific lesion. And other half are divided between the CTO and the left main. All right, Samin yeah. and Anu, I'm going to put you on a treadmill. Six months, six minutes to finish the case now. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. This should be good. Uh, and, let's and you'll get see action the fire. And you'll see Dr. Kitty do the, uh, the, the other thing that is critical there. She's got her catheter across. Now she'll change for workhorse yep. wire. Yep. Right. As these, these wires can be very dangerous. And I think the other thing you saw is that it, it, she did a wonderful job in, in coming back, a little, as you said, a little more proximal to where she'd been, put a different shape on the wire to find a new channel, a new track. I, just an yeah, excellent yeah. demonstration of how to do this. I think that's Now the it. thing always comes is what's what your uh, 300 wire. For this, you will need a 300 length wire because you have this uh, exchange length catheter. 
So you could either go with the Grand Slam 300, you use your high talk extra support 300, whatever which has a little extra support, mailman, whichever is uh, the wire that is available in the, in the lab. So the strategy is going to be They're some pre dilatation and placement of a drug eluting stent. Now. Yes. All right, and yes. uh, what uh, three five? Uh, well, no, that we will see. The I first thing is that since uh, you know it may be a little difficult, so that we always have a two or twenty Maverick open. Right. So that we dilate and then we use a high pressure uh, uh, the twenty NC Voyager and then decide with the stent. And I think that one stent approach, one stent should be good enough here. A little damp with your guide. Yeah. 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 No. Give me, take a picture. Also, now very important, since your uh, fine cross cross through the lesion, it's likely you will have some flow. And take a picture, make sure you're OK. And then you can Guide take your uh, other the the RCA catheter allowed. out. Excellent. Yeah. Once yeah. you're done, you don't need to put another catheter. Important thing in this kind of situation is also that make sure there's no clot formation. Right. As you notice, and she's done a great job of flushing the catheters, and that is one of the critical things, is to really make sure you're flushing uh, very regularly and very frequently. So we do see we are in the main vessel. I'm just taking the other wire out and leave it at the, in the groin. Yeah, so and uh, actually this is the clot uh, uh, catheters in, uh, is not unusual. I, three years ago, I was moderating the session in ACC, and uh, um, the, go. Oh, you have yeah, it. Yeah, that. Um, uh, that uh, clear they were in, uh, doing the retrograde injection of the LAD through the RCA, and RCA b became damped, and this whole catheter was you know was completely full of clots. Now the next uh, the question here comes is that uh, once we already have a fine cross across, we should not have an issue. If the fine cross had not crossed through that area, what would be your uh, next step? Samin, so, I have uh, confirmed uh, with the. With the camera people and uh, the support staff here, uh, we can go a few minutes uh, beyond. I think uh, this would be extremely important to see. Yeah, but case. We, we should be done in three minutes now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, usually if a balloon won't cross, there are a couple of things. One, a one five, even if a fine cross won't go, sometimes you can go one five balloon. And actually, even though it may not cross the whole lesion, because the marker is actually the thickest part of a balloon, the one five nose cone will get into the lesion and you can use that to crack it and sort of work your way from proximal to distal across. If that doesn't work, then the, the tornus catheters um, are excellent. You know, they're basically a, a, almost like an Archimedes screw with the coils in them, yeah. and you can basically dot or a channel across using tornus. Right. Right. Yeah. And in, in that situation, it's very rare that you can't, if you get a wire successfully across, it's very rare that you can't get equipment through. Now, the way we do it here is that suppose you are, uh, Fine cross had not crossed, and you have your stiffer uh, um, cat, uh, wire across the lesion. Other than the points uh, just uh, mentioned by Dr. Lombardi, what we would do is use a, a dark wire because now you have to get your fine cross out. Use a dark wire, and then you are the balloon that we just used, the 2 ohm Maverick, and that is the lowest profile that I have come across. That you have better in this kind of situation. And other uh, balloons that are uh, available is 1.5 uh, Firestar, and you also have the Apex balloons, which is, starts with 1.52. Any of these balloons you can try. If that still does not work, then when we, is the time we usually go for a uh, tornus. Uh, I mean, if and Ray, you know, and if there's no dissection, just uh, switching to a 1.25 uh, rota bar. Uh, is no, this is if we have not got, yeah. got a balloon yeah. across. The, I mean, many times your nose could be there and put a rota wire and boom. Uh, here we are dilated with the 2 uh, Now we are just going with the 2.520 NC Voyager. Just dilate this area, take a picture. 3028 uh, is that? Yeah, look for a 3028. So uh, this is the 2.520 uh, NC Voyager at 20 atmosphere. Looks so, uh, some level of superficial, maybe a speck calcium. of calcification, yeah, right towards the mid to distal end of the balloon. Uh. Yeah. Distal and proximal, yeah. yeah. See, one of the uh, uh, important, uh, I mean, scare for people not to go to CTO is uh, especially is the scare that they will exit the wire, sorry, exit the vessel, and uh, the wire caused perforation, and that is what uh, is we have seen that by using Angiomax that we have seen what we call is the smoke. You know, you go through uh, fine capillaries or you cause some dissection and you start seeing some smoke coming out of this uh, because you have exited, come out, 
and what we see in that situation is that we just stop the procedure, wait for a couple of minutes and then we go back, we never see it. Uh, I mean, wait about 20 minutes. Well, okay. also the very nice uh, point which you all, uh, the three of you emphasized upon is uh, not yes, to take yeah. any anti-grade injections yeah, at yeah. that time and uh, uh, so uh, decent uh, looking vessel, still a little underfilled, I am sure what, 3 of, three of stent would be yeah. your choice or even yeah. smaller? Yeah, yeah. I think three. Dr. Kenny brings, three or 28. Up, brings up a really important point. Um, in that wire perforation is actually, you know, fairly common but of very little consequence. And the reason is it usually occurs in the occlusion segment, so there's little inflow to it. So if all you go out with is the wire and not with a microcatheter or something bigger, usually just by bringing the wire back, it will occlude the channel and there'll be no flow and it'll seal itself. And that's really one of the big advantages of the collateral injections is you know where you are before you bring your microcatheter down into a potentially bad spot. Mm. Because the problem is that you have your wire is in the pericardium, you not realized it, you've gone through it and you're dilated with the balloon and that is bad news. Bill, I'm sure you've had a failed anti-grade which you brought back for a retrograde. Have you had occasions where you retried a failed retrograde? Yeah, actually there are several sort of high-end anti-grade techniques that we're developing in patients that you can't get retrograde. One of the problems with retrograde is only about 80% of the collaterals that we think we can wire can we actually successfully wire. It's actually the number one challenge of retrograde. Who's dilated? So you have to find Your sort point. of unique solutions in grade uh, to get success. And a lot of those are sort of sub intimal reentry maneuvers. Excellent. Go a few millimeter distal. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think this also highlights how, how well Dr. Kenny and Dr. Sharma have done on this, just their experience, the experience of the center their ability to do these very complicated cases in a, in again, timely fashion with an excellent result. Well, also I think uh, another very important uh, lesson that could be learned here, uh, which, uh, which, which is not going to be easy for the uh, beginner, is uh, the, the very important decision which was made, uh, uh, I, I attribute that only to experience, is uh, that, look, this is something, I, I spoke to Samin before the case, and he had no doubt whatsoever that he'll be able to do it anti-grade. And uh, I think it is exactly that feel you get uh, that, look, uh, this is what uh, I'll use my best uh, skills and the technique uh, rather than venture out uh, with the uh, retrograde uh, technique which you've uh, seen in a couple of live cases. Yeah, I mean, we actually are, one of the challenges about retrograde is just the complexity of the procedure and the difficulty in learning it. And there's those of us who are out there, it's, one of the things we really recommend is before you do retrograde one, you should do a lot of integrate and be very comfortable with the guide wires and all the te integrate techniques. And the second is we highly recommend that you get a proctor to come in and do two or three or four cases at least with you so that you can do them sort of safer because they are very complicated. There's a lot going on. And um, having a proctor there can help you deal with some of the potential pitfalls and complications of procedures. So, I mean, you need yeah. a non-compliant yeah. balloon yeah. there? Yeah. yeah, that's it. Therefore, I think that we can uh, sum it up uh, just to, if we can get to the last slide, uh, the take-home message for this case, because this now is a simple post-dilatation issue. And maybe if any other question which you have, that is the optimal technique and the strategy are crucial to avoid any potential complication. Clearly, it has to be knowing that the CTO, your goal should be that cause no harm. You need to stop and the small wire exit and so we don't need to worry about. You can wait and then go back in. But clearly the wire selection uh, and of course with the graded stiffness, if little wire out, wait, uh, restart, no need to quit that early. But the key is that no complication. Second, they require long time. Resources is so that should be carefully planned. And the patience, patience, patience. And most important, I said, the second try. That if failed, even if you, now let's say you created a, a, the extensive integrate or retrograde dissection integrate, so don't start stenting the entire vessel. Let's come out, bring the patient back six weeks. Actually, I had a case just done on uh, last Friday. Bifurcation distal RCA total. I could get into the PDA, but big AV continuation. And there is a dissection. I said, don't put a stent. Just PTCA will bring this patient back four to six weeks and complete the job. So the second try or second procedure is completely fine. And then, of course, I still believe that uh, part of the success of, is that long term. And long term, what is the issue? That is the re-stenosis. If any event happened to this patient, it's from the re-stenosis. 
that time we worry about the clots, uh, the collateral going down and so, so that if you use a DES, resnose is eliminated, acutely your technical part has been taken, so that I think this is the new frontier which we continue to evolve further and uh, propel further in terms of our international so cardiology. I mean, I have a couple of comments also, but before that there is another question for, uh, for Bill. Uh, well, uh, you had mentioned about uh, proctoring and doing a few cases. Uh, you know, when do these, uh, I mean, is uh, this, this uh, American international cardiologist uh, flying on Japan Airlines uh, to head to Tokyo, is that going to end uh, sometime? Uh, will there be enough skilled people in the United States? Uh, I, I certainly hope so. I think that there's, there's several of us that are taking this on and being highly successful at it and learning retrograde. So I think it's clearly able, there are clearly several of us out there that have done enough to proctor, teach, and expose you. There's several of us now that have done more than 100 retrograde procedures. So I think that we'll soon see this as an American procedure, not a Japanese procedure, with our own style and flair to it, and set up to work within our own practice environment, which is, is different than our Japanese colleagues. Anu, final thoughts from yeah. you. I must compliment you on your absolutely superb patience, excellent techniques, uh, great tactile uh, maneuvering there, uh, excellent uh, use of uh, all the equipment which Samin talked about. Uh, any final thoughts on the case? Yeah, just the take home message would be if that you are doing this as a head of procedure, have a good view. I mean, I, I always say you cannot become a superb interventionalist without becoming an excellent angiographer. So you've taken your beautiful pictures, know exactly where's your entry site, so that you have one view to work on, not like multiple views keep changing, keep changing on all different views. Take one or two views, you know exactly where the vessel is so that you start working on that. That's one. And the most important thing, going back to the patients, and as you know, there's no lab busier than our lab that it is, you see people keep coming with phone calls, doctors calling, patient calling, family calling, all these things. To do CTO, you cannot have any disturbance because well, you are at that particular moment where your tactile sensation is there, you want to make a little turn, you want to do that, somebody is coming in, saying somebody is calling you. That is why this lab is considered the CTO lab because <laughs> you don't see anybody. This you room. have your uh, screen against people, close the door, it's called a CTO suite so that Nice, calm, cool. Nobody's bothering you. Take your patience. And like you've seen that we are doing it faster and faster. And more important also, which I give a lot of importance, is the dye. And the dye used today, Pablo? 120. Yeah, 120 with both dual injection. We pay a lot of importance to the dye because you're not just doing the procedure. Subsequent, your complication also cannot happen. And uh, like I think Dr. Lombardi mentioned, that the American way of doing these things is do it uh, safely and do it uh, faster by using a better technique. Okay. All right, Yay. we can show the last picture and that's it. If you want to just show the last, I take a post dilated and just a quick glimpse of the, yeah. Looks this is the last outstanding. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to thank all three of you. Uh, Bill, thank you for making the effort uh, for coming and educating us further. Uh, Samin and Anu, excellent job. Uh, I want to remind our viewers that because of the American College of Cardiology's uh, scientific meeting uh, next month, we are changing the date. Uh, we'll be on live on the on March the 9th at 9 o'clock uh, instead of March 16th. So please note that. That is an exception. We will see you on March 9th. And thank you for joining us. Uh, keep sending the questions. and. Uh, We'll try to be providing the answers to all the questions which were posed today on the website. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.